Thank you, Norm. Good morning. And welcome to Amelia United Methodist Church on this beautiful day that the God has given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, even though it is raining. Announcements. Um, we have a an ad council meeting um, on Tuesday at 7. Uh, so if you are a member of the ad council, please come and join us. If you are not a member of the ad council, please come and join us as well. Um, there's a trustees meeting, and I think that is in two Tuesdays, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Frank. Um, so at 7 o'clock, if you are a trustees, please come and join the trustees. I have, thank you, it's August 9th. Um, I have an announcement from Barb Benson. Okay, thank you, Barb. Um, she mentioned about school supplies being given at one of the churches around the area. Glen SD Church of Christ um, is next Saturday. Um, if you have any questions, you can see Barb about that. And we also are having a rummage sale on the 13th um, from not 10 to 3, I'm so sorry. Um, but if you can come and help the week prior, that would be also um, needed. So please see Barb for anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Beth. Um, we have game night tonight, rain or shine from 6 to 8. Um, if we have to, we'll move indoors, but it looks like the rain will be leaving by about 1 o'clock. So any youth are invited, um, fourth grade and up tonight. We still have our food, our raffle, our games. If we move inside, we just can't do our water games. I don't think anybody would appreciate water balloons in the fellowship hall. Um, if it is outside, we will be blocking off majority of the parking lot. Um, so you will still be able to park over by the kitchen on like that lower part there and across the street, but we are blocking off everything else because it doesn't seem to matter how much of the parking lot we block off. Um, if we don't like totally cut it off, somebody still drives around the kids. Um, so just for safety, we're just marking it off. Uh, there will be pink tape instead of caution tape so it doesn't look like a crime scene. Um, so, so if you drive by the church, that's what you're seeing. Um, so, but we are having game night tonight, rain or shine, it's still going to happen. Uh, second of all, you probably saw the email for Eastern Kentucky. Um, you've probably seen it in the news as well as on social media for the uh, massive flooding that has happened um, in Owsley County, where the youth actually stayed in June on my family's property, uh, which is called Buffalo Creek. That has been hit the hardest out of the entire county, and they are currently under another flood watch today. Um, one family, there's a big general like collection of water and cleaning supplies going on in lots of areas. But there is one family um, on the creek, as you can see, uh, that they lost everything and they were hiding on the side of the mountain under a tarp watching it happen. Uh, so we are uh, collecting clothes for them at the moment. Um, if you are like me and you absolutely hate clothes shopping, whether it's for yourself or somebody else, we I will take cash down. I will take like Walmart gift cards down. Their options for clothing shopping is pretty limited down there. So like Walmart and like Family Dollar is what their options are for shopping. Uh, so if you are like, I hate shopping and I don't, I don't have anything to give, I don't want to go out and look, here you go. I will take it down to them for them to go pick out what works for them. If you bring anything in, that is fine. Um, you can bring it to the office um, or, and drop it off in the youth room or at the church office. I'm going to be collecting until Thursday so that I can take items down on Friday to them. So if you would like um, to be involved in that, you are more than welcome to be. If you are like, nope, I'm good, that's fine too. But as always, we would appreciate prayers. Um, are there any other announcements in the house? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Okay. Operation Christmas Child is on the horizon. We collect in November, but now is a good time for deals. Yes, Barb. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, drop off for the rummage sale would be Sunday, next Sunday, and Monday the 8th. So Sunday the 7th and Monday the 8th. All right, let us welcome the Lord into our service this morning with silent prayer. Of our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning I will be reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and then 8 through 14. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please rise and join us as we sing praises to our Lord and Savior this morning. Am I on? Thanks. I don't think I'm going to have this problem with you all this morning. There seems to be more of you. I had to shame the early service into singing louder. I'm not opposed to stopping the song and shaming you. So, sing out.
Say 
Thank you, folks. It was good. Okay. Do I sound echoey? No. It does it up here. <clears throat> I've got a prayer request here, um, and I have some from the first service. Uh, first of all, Pastor Ed is unable to join us today. He is quarantined. Um, Mary um, tested positive for COVID. She just has some cold-like symptoms, so um, um, she's not feeling too bad, but we want to keep her and uh, Pastor Ed um, in our prayers. Uh, we're also praying healing prayers for Bob Cooker after... Uh, his leg amputation. Uh, Mary Ellis family, uh, remember them for the passing of their son. Uh, Zelda is back in the hospital and prayers for the family of Jessica. Are there any um, unspoken requests? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, you are so good. You're so merciful. 
And you're so kind. Thank you, God, that when we have burdens on our heart, that we can bring them to you. That we can find comfort in you. And Father, thank you that you will allow us to intercede in our praying for others like Mary Ellis and Zelda and Jessica's family and healing for Bob and um, Pastor Ed and Mary. But God, we also thank you that it's not only in those times of uh, burden that we can come to you. We can come with our celebrations, with good news about what's happening in our lives. And God, we just thank you that we always have somebody to celebrate with. Lord, we want to also remember those that are in eastern Kentucky, those families that have lost loved ones, those that have lost everything, all their household possessions. Father, I would ask that you would touch the hearts of the Christian community that we may respond in a a way that's just absolutely loving and reflects your love for them. And Father, you are really good about letting the light of Christ shine through even the most thick darkness. Lord, I also ask for prayers for this congregation that, Lord, that our hearts would be convicted to be the people that you called us to be, to be a reflection of you, not only in words, but in actions. We pray for revival in this community, but let it first start with us. Bring revival to our hearts and remind us of the joy of being your child. Father, you are so good. And I just thank you for being God, for being a God that really cares, a God that really loves. And I pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Can you do better than that? Good morning. Okay. All right. There's more of you that, to, in, in this service than the earlier one. Um, nobody has an excuse more than I do. I've spent the week camping at the Claremont County Fairgrounds uh, with my oldest son. We've volunteered. Well, we didn't volunteer. We actually got paid to pick up the trash that everybody left around all week long. So that meant camping in the wonderful late July humidity and inhaling somewhere in the vicinity of, I don't know, maybe a cubic yard of fairgrounds dust into my windpipe. So, uh, mental note to self, don't sign up for special music the Sunday after the end of the fair. Um, I've been working on a a number of songs just to try and have them ready. Um, I came in with a certain song in mind, and then I consulted with uh, Pastor Russ, and... um, decided on a different tune. This is one I've, I've played for you before. It's one that the, whole, the Holy Spirit gave to me. Uh, it's called Let Me Be Your Light. Are we good on sound? ever darkening world. May 
it shine through me as your glory is unfurled. When your light comes shining in, the darkness runs and hides. Rather than curse the darkness, let me be your light. can be so trying as we live out our lives, wanting for the truth while we buy temptation's lies. Confusion only grows as more liars shout to be heard. Where can we find the truth but in your holy word? Let me be your light in this ever darkening world let it shine through me as your glory is unfurled when your light comes shining in the darkness runs and hides rather than curse the darkness let me be your light the darkness is dangerous it makes us stumble and fall But it's your light that ends the long dark night And shines the way for us all I will be your light in this ever darkening world It's gonna shine through me as your glory is unfurled When your light comes shining in The darkness runs and hides Rather than curse the darkness, let me be your, I will be your light in this ever darkening world. It's gonna shine through me as your glory is unfurled. When your light comes shining in, the darkness runs and hides. Rather than curse the darkness, let me be your light. Have a plea. Let me be your light. Lord, I pray. I will be your Dan, thanks for sharing that. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? As you listen to um, the words, there's just so much truth. Um, and interestingly enough, following that, you know, God always does incredible things, and he is far ahead of us. Pastor Ed asked me if I could fill in for him one Friday, so it's two days ago, and I find it interesting, the scripture that I landed on um, works well with that song. It's... Um, Walking in the light is what it's entitled in my Bible. And it's First John, and I'm going to let you get a minute to get to that. First John, chapter 5, or I'm sorry, First John, uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 5 through 10. It's also up here on the screen, First John, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And it reads, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us of all will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all righteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is 
God's word for God's people. Praise be to God. Several years ago, I received a notice in the mail. And that notice says, congratulations, you have been selected to serve on jury duty. Now, for a lot of people, the idea of serving on a jury is not all that appealing. In fact, it's amazing what people will do and say to wiggle their way out of jury duty. However, I'm one of those oddballs that finds the whole judicial system really interesting. And to tell you the truth, I was pretty excited about my opportunity to be a juror. Now, although I wasn't selected uh, to be a juror on that trial, I had the distinct privilege of going through the selection process. Now, there were about 30 people in the courtroom, the judge, the prosecuting attorney, and the defense attorney. They were all given an opportunity to question us to make sure that we were the right type of person to benefit their cause. They asked all kinds of questions like, where do you work? Have you ever been arrested? That's a good one. And they ask you all kinds of things about your beliefs and your personal life. Now, this particular case was a criminal case, and the judge began by explaining that in a criminal case, the defendant is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. Now, the burden of proof rests solely on the prosecutor. Now, our task as a juror is to, um, to determine if the prosecution uh, proved their case beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, at the end of the trial, the jurors would to go into a deliberation room. And there, the question would be, as they reviewed the evidence and all the witnesses, did the prosecution prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Also, were the witnesses credible? And if we found that the prosecutor had done his job or her job, the verdict would have been guilty. Now, if we were to find that the prosecutor didn't, our verdict would be not guilty. Now, determining reasonable doubt comes from a, well, a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or lack of evidence that has been presented during trial. Now, jurors, when they're in that deliberation room, they should ask themselves, is the evidence with what the prosecution is trying consistent? Does it make sense? Is it logical? Does what they say make sense? And are the witnesses credible? Can we believe them? Can we believe what they say? One may say this, the other may say that. And we have to determine credibility. And does all the evidence presented convince me that the person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Now, I have to tell you, for 2,000 plus years, the Christian church has been on trial. And under great scrutiny, perhaps greater scrutiny in the last few years than in years past. And seated in uh, the jury box is not a jury made up of 12 people. Rather, it's a jury made up of 7.7 billion people who populate this earth. You know, the world jury looks at the Christian church with great scrutiny and skepticism. And they ask, is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the message that the Christians proclaim is true? Or are they simply people who say one thing 
and do another for the sake of convenience or personal pleasures. This world jury is always asking, is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt that we can believe the Christian church is telling us the truth? Is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt that we can rely upon their testimony? Is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt that their witness is credible? Truthfully, these are really good questions for an outsider to answer when they're looking in at the church. And these questions are the same questions the world jury is asking. Now, to help answer these questions and for the Christian church to stand up under this scrutiny, we may first, we need to first understand that when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about this building or the building across the street. We're not talking about United Methodist, Global Methodist, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Catholics. No. The church is made up of you and me and other believers who fall into the category of calling themselves Christians. Church is not a series of denominations or buildings. The, the church is made up of followers of Christ. And I said that twice for a reason. Because I wanted to sink in. So often we think about the church universal. And then we think about the local church. But the church is us. You and my, me. That is what the world sees. They see you and me. And the rest of the world that claims to be Christians... And what they see influences their perspective on the Christian church and how they respond to the church. That only makes sense, right? We're influenced by the things that we see and hear. But from the world jury box, our conduct and how we react to life, good or bad, is a direct reflection on what it means to be a Christian. Now, here's something that's really important to remember. How we act when we proclaim to be Christians is also, in their eyes, a direct reflection on Jesus Christ. When you think about it, that is an awesome responsibility. And it's a responsibility that rests on each and every Christian. As a Christian, it is our calling and our responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We have the duty to live as Christ lived. We have the duty to love as Christ loves. And we have the duty to respond to the world as Christ responded. The Christian is to walk in the light and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take a look at today's scripture from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And it reads, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, in him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness... We lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Here the light represents the very nature of God. God is sinless and pure. And darkness represents sin, evil. So in essence, this passage is telling us that God is pure and without sin. Now the scripture then challenges us. It challenges our response as to say that if we claim to be Christians, Christ followers, we too need to walk in the light, not in the darkness of sin. 
and to do our best. Our best to live out a life according to the teachings of Christ. When we do live a Christ-centered life, we become credible witnesses to Christ and all that the church is, and all, or I'm sorry, and all that Christ is and all that Christ will be to the world. Being a credible witness to this world jury is critical to the success of helping people discover Christ. And I have to tell you, it takes more than lip service to lead someone to Christ. It takes hard, cold evidence, just like in the courtroom. So what kind of evidence can we present to this skeptical world jury? When we tell others about the joy that we find in a relationship with Christ, we need to put on a smile. A smile that invites someone to perhaps ask you about your faith. I got to share this with you. It happened this week. I've been going to pulmonary uh, rehab. Now, I've been trying to call it um, physical therapy because rehab sounds kind of weird. I say, oh, I'm going to rehab. Be back in a little bit. But anyway, there are a bunch of RNs, registered nurses there, and they're helping you get stronger and, and do some things. And there was this young girl, uh, um, and I asked her, she's just always so cheerful. And I said, I said, young lady, why is it that you're always so happy? And I was kind of just trying to make humor at that point. And she says, because I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, that's really cool. She did that in the middle of a whole bunch of people in a secular world. She gave her testimony. But you know, her testimony wasn't simply the words that she spoke. Her testimony was the cheerfulness, the happiness, the love that flowed out of her was a witness to the love of Christ. When we tell folks about the love of Christ, the love that he has for the world, the we need to demonstrate compassion. We need to demonstrate forgiveness and a willingness and a commitment to demonstrate Christ's love. Sometimes that's very, very difficult to do. We have to make an intentional effort at that. We have to sometimes swallow our pride and give people the benefit of a doubt. And when we tell people that a relationship with Jesus Christ is life-changing, and, it is trans and it's it, because of the transforming power of Jesus Christ, we need to live a godly life. We need to show where our lives are different. You heard the word set apart, or word set apart, a number of times. And what that means is that we are set apart from the world. Doesn't mean we're perfect as Christians. But the way we think and hopefully the way we act is a little different than from the world. When we don't do these things, it's, we really don't have to guess what's going on in the minds of the world jury, do we? They are thinking that our actions don't align with what we're telling them. And when your actions don't align with what's coming out of your mouth, that diminishes your credibility. And then the message of Christ becomes suspect in their mind. Now, in order to be a credible witness to the redeeming love that God offers and his offer of salvation, the Christian must do more than talk the talk. Now, here's where you participate. We have to then walk the walk. Let's try that again. We can't talk the talk. We have to walk the walk. That's important today in the Christian church. 
So much of the time we come to church on Sunday, we listen to a sermon. Sometimes they're okay, sometimes they're not, but we come. But what happens between Sunday and the next Sunday? Are we committed Christians to living a life-transforming lifestyle? It's got to be more of walking the walk. Now, Matthew 6, 24 tells us that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. When we make a commitment to serve Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we must commit to making him the master of our life, the center of our life, And I think last week I preached something that says, make the main thing the main thing. Commitment. You know, sometimes I think we want to approach our faith and just kind of hold on to our faith in such a way that we're not all in. That part of us is, eh, I kind of like this. But yes, I love God. Isn't that true? But when we claim to be a Christian and we don't walk in the light of Christ, we lose that credibility. We lose our witness. And it also causes the world to be confused because we say one thing and we do the other. And people would say, can we believe them? Can we believe them? Do they even know what they believe? Are they committed to serving this God, this Christ, as their master? People believe what they see more than they do of what they hear. Especially when it comes to human behavior. You know, and that confusion is just not with in them. It's also an internal battle with us we set out to live live a life that's pleasing to God but because of our weakness our sinful nature we cave into temptation and we find ourselves drawn to sin rather than walking with Christ a good prayer is to say dear God help me love you help me desire you more than I love name your sin or desire that. Help me love you more than pleasing the world. You see, that's what's making the main thing the main thing. As we put Christ ahead of all. Now, this is an ongoing battle with a Christian. and No matter how hard we try, there will be times that we miss the mark. And that's where God's grace comes in. You know, we won't be perfect until that day where we enter the pearly gates of heaven. That is when we will find perfection. And when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Verses 8 and 10 tells us, if we claim to be at without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his world has no place in our life. Yeah, we've all sinned. I know I have. That's because of our sinful nature. When we do sin and we seek forgiveness and repentance, Jesus becomes, I was going to use the word advocate, but I think the better word is he becomes the defense attorney that doesn't say that we're not guilty, but one who pleads for leniency. Interesting, isn't it? Pleads for leniency. Our forgiveness rests not on our own actions, not on our own power, but on the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. (laughs) 
I have to tell you that throughout my time as an active pastor, one of the things that I remember so much about first taking the pulpit, I learned that people believe what you say. And I believe that people think you have it together. That scares me. But, you know, I told the congregations that I never want you to look and say, Russ Abb has got it down. What I want you to do is say, Russ Abbott may be the most broken person in this church. But yet God forgives him. God loves him. And because of that, God can forgive me and God can love me. You know, our, our repentance and acknowledgement of God's forgiveness can be one of the most powerful testimonies and demonstrates God's love. That's what needs to be presented to the world jury. You know, I'm not really interested in being around people that tell me how good they are. Because I know that they're not that good. You know, they're, they're boasting and they're bragging. But I can relate to people's stories where they were broken. They were hurting. And they were humble. That's what gets my ears. And I believe that's what uh, touches the ears and the hearts of the world jury. Our obedience to Christ's teachings is essential for the life of a Christian. 1 John 2 through 6 tells us, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The person who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. That's strong. And the truth is not within him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. They must do more than talk the talk. They got to walk the walk. You know, scripture makes it crystal clear that our obedience or our lack of obedience is evidence of our faith and our commitment to Christ. You know, I think today, and I, I point my finger at myself first, We always have to look at our commitment. Are we truly committed? Can you imagine the power and what the Holy Spirit could do with a group of committed Christians who are willing to put Christ first? I think it would be remarkable. You know, not only our obedience to serve God is evidence of, uh, to the world, but our obedience and willingness to walk into the light serves as evidence to our commitment to God personally. This morning, I want to ask you a few questions, just like they did at the jury box. Is there evidence in your life that you are walking in the light of Christ? Is there evidence? If someone were around you for, let's say, a day or two, somebody you just met, at the end of that second day, would they know that you are a Christian and a committed disciple of Jesus Christ? Would the world jury see evidence in your life that your life is better because you are a follower of Christ? Would all the evidence be strong enough to convict you if you were on trial for being a Christian. And there's plenty of places in the world where they still hold trials. This is a critical question. Or these are critical questions because someday, someday, we'll all be on trial where Christ shall sit in the judgment seat and act as sole judge. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that each one may receive the things done in body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The key point is that we will, all of us, stand before God, that judgment seat of Christ, and there's no exceptions. Peter, Paul, all the saints, Moses, whether it be Old or New Testament, they will stand in front of God. And I want to share with you some not so good news, but I think it's absolute truth. Those who have rejected God will have a different experience on Judgment Day than those who are true Christians. They will stand before Christ, who's seated on that great white throne of judgment. And on that judgment day, that judgment day will be for them all about punishment. They will be cast in the lake of fire. Here's my plea to you this morning. If you love somebody, if you care about somebody, if you have compassion for humankind, Be a great witness. Be a credible witness by words and actions. Don't be afraid to tell them about Jesus. Get over that fear because the Holy Spirit will equip you to say what the Spirit is leading you to say. And the Holy Spirit's about good, about opening. About opening opportunities for us to share our faith. Don't be reluctant to ask that person that you run into, your neighbor, to come to church with you. And do it in a way of saying, you want to ride with me? You want to go to lunch after church with me? You see, we we as Christians need to let the world jury know that we are the real deal. And that Christ is the real deal. And let me finish with some really good news. And that good news for you this morning is the Christian, the true believer and follower of Christ, will stand before Jesus. And yes, there will be a counting of our lives. However, this judgment, the believer's judgment, is not punishment. But when we see our lives before us and we see our sinful nature, God will remind us that we are pardoned, that we are forgiven. And at last, we will come to the full and wonderful understanding of the depth and breadth of God's extravagant love and forgiveness and grace. Amen. Heavenly Father, We all missed the target, and we're thankful, Lord, that you offer us grace. Without it, we would be doomed. But God, as we move forward as a church, as individuals, help us to have the courage to tell people we love you. Give us what we need to be able to invite people in help us to be people that not only talk the talk but walk the walk help us to be people that will make you the main thing so father god we praise you this morning and we thank you and in jesus name amen
Christians go forth from this place, walk in the light of Christ, love as Christ loved, forgive as Christ forgave. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, may God's peace rest upon each and every one of you. Amen.